Those of us who are in the society again has been blessed with the message of Islam. We have a responsibility to convey the message of Islam to non-Muslims and perhaps lapsed Muslims, the spiritual, social, and economic message. This is, this is an opportunity to convey an alternative to people, an Islamic solution to the current socioeconomic problem, pointing out how Islam continues to possess qualities of faith which many Christian denominations are dropping as they embrace the current popular trend. It means that we have to educate ourselves in these alternatives as well, because we have to know what to, t what to tell them. We once had a, uh, a demonstration about usury in Norwich, and I was speaking to the Lord Mayor, and he said, well, what can you do if you need money for a business? And I started explaining the Karad loans in Islam to him, and he said, that's a really good idea. So there's a lot of things that we can convey to non-Muslims, and hopefully that opens something that will lead further into their hearts. Now, the current time we are in is a time of flux. And people really, really do need Islam as an alternative. In 2019, Sean Rosenberg, who is a professor of political science at UC Irvine, delivered a paper in which he said that democracy is devouring itself and will not last. He pointed out that democracy requires hard work of individuals and it was the elites who had done the hard work in the past with varying degrees of success. And basically, basically kind of democracy was more of an oligarchy. There was a group of people who did the management and people tend to look at newspapers or something and this vote without understanding all the kind of issues involved. And in the, in the end, this kind of has come to the point with social media, where everyone thinks they know what's right, which is what they're told, not what they thought. And we're ending, we're ending up as the alternative of right-wing populism. And there's also another one which is known as algorithmic cap capitalism, which is where the AI decides what you want to what's going to happen, which I have a feeling is what the Saudis are going to be doing when they're kind of dystopian, lying village, which is meant to be run completely by computer. Now, the political system Islam is an alternative which really needs to get out there to non-Muslims. Not only do we have something that will answer their spiritual questions and needs, we have something that will answer their political and social ones. Again, this has to be nuanced. We don't want to put up something like ISIS. <laughs> we want to kind of show them there's a whole range of solutions to problems. It doesn't involve dropping into an authoritarian regime. And the closest practical exa example we have of this, because we do have a fairly recent example, is the Sokoto Caliphate in the 19th century where Islamic governments was implemented and worked effectively. And that, they were in contact with Europeans. There's, there is one account where the British representative came to the emir of Sokoto and offered him these kind of rare volumes from their libraries. And he looked at them and said, yeah, I've got them in my library. I don't need them. So, it, they weren't impressed by the, European, by the Europeans when they came to them, and they had a very effective way of working. This was in the 19th century, which is not that long ago. So I recommend the second volume of the African Caliphate for those who are interested. But the fact is we have a lot of work to do, and probably a lot of work in educating ourselves and what we can offer to the non-Muslims. We offer them the, spirit, the spiritual reality, we offer them the social reality and cohesion, economic in the form of kirad and abolishing usury, and the political dimensions, which are still, which we can see back in the Sokoto Caliphate, how they can be implemented in modern times. It's not a medieval thing, as the media keeps telling you. It's much more modern than that. And if you look at Islamic 
Islamic law is much more fluid. We have accounts of the kind of judge dealing with a, an issue, and he would, look at, he would get different fatwas from different ones of the fuqaha, and he would try to find the one that would make people the most in harmony with each other while being within the Islamic Sharia at the same time. So Islam has a much more fluid and adaptive nature to it. And I think I'm being warned about I'm getting too long. <laughs> so one of the things, as mentioned, scholars tend to start talking. <laughs> so I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, shukran. Thank you so much, uh, Sheikha Aisha, uh, for that wonderful reminder to us all of the things we need to remind people of in these days of um, modernism and political chaos. Um, so that's the end of our session, or I'm bringing uh, our session to an end. Um, we are here to celebrate um, Fatima Elizabeth Cates, but I thought we might take a moment of reflection to celebrate and call to memory a few other people that have passed away, scholars and Muslims of our time. Ayman Abdul Qadir Ahwal, a British journalist, filmmaker, craftsman and environmentalist from Birmingham, 2011. Who could forget Mariam Ramsey of Oxford, 2014, and the wonderful, quiet, and unassuming Morris Sufian Gent of Bingley, 2007. Another great lady from Burnley in Lancashire, Aisha Jones. I don't know if anybody remembers Aisha Jones here. Does anybody remember Aisha Jones? An amazing activist in Burnley. And of course, there were the greats. Charles Hassan Lagai Eaton, a wonderful writer, prolific writer, mashallah. And the amazing and beautiful Martin Lings, Islamic scholar, author, poet, and philosopher. Bill Thornley from down the road here in Grappen Hall, who passed away in the late 1900s, uh, 19, I think it was 1998. Dowd Hancock, Nelson and Burnley. A man, a young man from London, who was killed instantly following an accident of her motorcycle the morning that she was supposed to come with me on her first Umrah. I remember her very fondly today because we are going on Umrah on Thursday with 35 converts to Islam. Please God, inshallah, they will all make it. And please God, Amani's Umrah was accepted by Allah and she is rewarded for it. Hassan John Morrison from Chippenham in Kent in 2016. So there are so many, and I'm sure that all of you here can recall so many, and Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Murabit, who could forget? SubhanAllah. May Allah reward and bless them all. May He open the gates of Janatal for those. May He forgive them their shortcomings. And may He grant them to be together in the garden with the believers, inshallah. And I think it's fitting that we remember all these people because we are not the first and we won't be the last. Blessed, we are blessed to have with us scholars here today, homegrown scholars from within our own convert community. And the many mature converts here who are serving the community, both individuals and, um, individuals and together uh, as mem members of organizations representing uh, serving the community. And of course, we all do that because we remember the hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, Verily, the hearts of the children of Adam, all of them, are between the two fingers of the merciful as one heart. He directs them wherever he wills. And I know that together we are all in this room equipping ourselves, therefore, to welcome these hearts with wisdom and compassion, recognizing 
that they have been guided by him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the merciful to us, his faithful servants, for the help and the support they so richly deserve. Jazakum Allah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Many thanks to our sisters in Islam for those amazing and inspirational and very informative presentations. Um, we next up have Professor Ron Jeeves, who is honorary visiting professor at my alma mater, Cardiff University. MashaAllah. He's going to talk to us about a historical overview of England's first mosque, and this will include a brief video presentation, inshallah. Sir. History is more than um, the beginnings of the mosque, which is a story that's been told again and again now. Um, and I'm certainly consider one of the prouder moments of my life the opportunity to write the biography of Abdullah Quilliam. Um, you know, I'm, I don't like to be proud of myself, but of that achievement, I have some pride. <laughs> it's my history, it's your history, um, but remarkably, I would like to say that in this room, we have many Sheikh Abdullah Quilliams, and we have many Fatima Cates. You know, and we all, as human beings, sit upon the shoulders of those who came before us. And for the Muslims and the Muslim community in this country, um, these are those that came before. When I studied the Dear Bundy tradition, they used to talk a lot to me about how their origins were in their pious ancestors the founders of Deoband. Well, you also have pious ancestors <laughs> as British Muslims, and we're celebrating them here today. So, I would like to talk a little bit about history in a sense, because for me, I've reached a point in my career, um, most people have forgotten, I think, except those who know me as an academic, that I began researching and studying the contemporary Muslim community uh, as a kind of religious studies stroke sociologist in 1988 when I did my master's degree at the Community Religions Project at Leeds. I came, when I started my academic career, I came here not to Liverpool first, but my first chair was at the University of Chester. And at that time, it was probably the craziest time of my life because there were certain events that were bringing Muslims in Britain to the forefront of the news, which is really what I didn't want and never have wanted Muslims to be remembered for because they were not my experience of the Muslim community. I absolutely treasure and honor more than that, it's emotional for me. So many friends that I have in this room and beyond. I really do. You've enriched my life in a way that I could not even have imagined it would have been enriched. Thank you, all of you. And it was, it was a real joy for me coming here today and I would just like to thank, in passing, um, Dr. Hamid. I, I came in um, last, yesterday, sort of <laughs> checking up, <laughs> really. <laughs> I was kind of, sort of walked in to see if everything, all the arrangements were okay. I kind of felt a little bit of a personal responsibility as a trustee you know, of the Abdullah Quilliam Society. And it's my role as a trustee to be responsible for heritage. So I walked into this room, and I just went, ah. I, I, I'm not joking, this was a building site. Only at this time, yesterday afternoon. There were painters, plasterers, electricians. I mean, you name it, they were running around, and I don't know what time they got to bed this morning, 
But I know that Dr. Hamid, who was coordinating that, hasn't slept all night. Well done. <laughs> really well done. I, I, when I walked through the door this afternoon, for the first time to see this room, I just went, wow, a miracle has been achieved. <laughs> Extraordinary. This is what, you know, as the Abdullah Quilliam Society, honestly, we could have said, let's do this if it hadn't been for this event, because we've always wanted these rooms to be opened up to, as extra meeting halls. We would have talked about it. We would have had trustees meetings about it. We would have probably been thinking in two years' time that we would do it when we had the money. <laughs> Four days, and we did it. So, you know, <laughs> what do they say? Necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah, so... Huh? 11 o'clock this morning. There you go. <laughs> that spirit, when we talk about history, I like to think, and I come back to my own career, when I came to Chester and then I moved from Chester to Liverpool, to Liverpool Hope University, and I was approached by um, Akbar Ali, the founding member of the Abdullah Quilliam Society. And he asked me whether I would set up a series of lectures on the history of Islam in Britain. He had been turned down by John Moores, and he had been turned down by Liverpool University. I was at Liverpool Hope. I said, yeah, let's do it. And we set up a joint lectures between the University Theology Department and the Abdullah Quillian Society. And I remember our first lecture was um, Dr. Mohammed Seddon, who came and spoke on the Yemeni um, community. That started my relationship with this remarkable group of people. I didn't know and I had no idea that just a couple of years down the road, Akba Ali would come to me and say, Ron, write the biography of Abdullah Quilliam. I'm not an historian either, so my, my initial reaction was, you've got to be kidding. I was also surprised that no one had already done it, to be honest. It was such a kind of an iconic story that I couldn't believe that someone hadn't already written it. History... I was reminded, can be long, but it can also be very short. In order to say yes, I took advice from a real historian, my good friend and colleague, Professor Hamayun Ansari. I said, what should I do? I said, you should be doing this, not me. <laughs> you know? And he said to me, Rod, you're a historian? I said, I'm not. So I'm trained as a religious studies scholar with a bit of anthropology and sociology thrown in. He said, you are an historian. He said, you go and visit a contemporary community, a Sufi kanka, a, a Darulum, a mosque. He said, you write it up. By the time you've got all the research done, he said, probably takes you two years to do that. He said, then another two years to get it into a journal. Then you join the journal waiting list. So by the time it comes out, probably five, six years has gone by. That's called history. <laughs> he said, you're just going to go back a bit further, that's all. I had no idea what that biography was going to do for my life. It was much, much more than an academic journey. It was a highly emotional journey into someone else's existence. Someone who inspired me, whose frailties I recognize, because we all have those, but also whose commitment and energy and perseverance for his new faith were extraordinary for all of his flaws and faults. That's the story of every human being who is a person of faith. None of us can stand up before the only one who is perfect and say, we are perfect beings. In the words of Jesus, when you point a finger, there are fingers pointing back at you. 
I also didn't realize what a community I was going to join. And after the publication of the book, and I really want to thank Yahya down here. Yahya, you are a hard taskmaster. You drive a scholar to perfection. <laughs> he, he doesn't let up. Um, and it, he, he rang me. I was trying to get Oxford University Press to do it, which is what the university wanted too. Um, he rang me up and he said, hey, who are you publishing with? I said, I'm trying to get Oxford. He said, forget it, you're going with Cube. <laughs> I said, what? I said, I don't think my university are going to like Cube. That's not going to look well on any um, research statistics. A Muslim publisher in, you know, in, in Markfield. I said, so, convince me. He said, I'll offer you two things. He said, I'll offer you an editor who knows as much about Quilliam, he said, as you do. Um, he said, and who, he said, will work with you every step of the way rather than just some anonymous person. And second, he said, I'll offer you a Muslim readership. And that's what I wanted above anything else. This is history in my life. I wanted a Muslim readership because I wanted to give back to the Muslim community in a sense for making my career as an academic. That's history for me. It happened. But in that process, I suddenly realized at the end of that book, you know what? I don't want to be the kind of academic that I was. I want to be in there, working with the community. I tried for a while working with politicians. I got very disillusioned with that very quickly. At the time, it was prevent and trying to persuade them of how ill-sighted some of that was. And in the end, I thought, let me go into the community itself and just work on my own with them. The book... In the first year that it came out, I did five academic lectures and 65 community lectures. And I realized, and this is history too, history is powerful. When you talk about the history of this mosque, it is not just something that happened in the Victorian era. The history of this mosque is right here now. This event is also a part of the history of this mosque. We are the continuation of Abdullah Quilliam's community.